This is part 15 in a series of videos in which I'm attempting to create a reproduction of the ADM3A dumb terminal main board. In the previous videos I've got as far as getting the uh, fundamental system up and running. Uh, in the previous video we looked at getting some data into one of the banks of RAM and that seemed to be working to a certain extent. Uh, I can't send data from the keyboard or from the serial uh, port yet uh, but I want to get this working in stages so I'm currently working on making sure the RAM is working as a, a separate subsystem. Just to cover a, a couple of comments uh, I was asked whether this board had the option 7 uh, included. Uh, I've only included uh, options that were in the schematics I have and although the option 7 was shown on the uh, actual board that I have here it's not in the schematics so I have not included anything in the schematics uh, or rather anything that was not in the schematics that I have. It's actually quite a complex process. The schematics are more complex than they look because most of the interconnections are not actually shown, they're just labelled. Um, so I was more interested in making sure this board would work. The option 7 is in, it is mentioned in the service manual and it's nothing more than a, a beep defeat, it just actually turns off the speaker so um, when I saw that I wasn't too concerned about it. Had it been an important option I might have looked into it in more detail uh, but switching off the speaker is something that uh, you can do externally so does not need to be an option on the actual board. In fact when I was testing the uh, original unit uh, I ended up unplugging the speaker because as the comment said it does get very irritating very quickly um, but it's a speaker so you can just uh, fit an external switch or just unplug it. Uh, but no, I've only included uh, options that were actually in the uh, schematic and I've added an additional option for the uh, font set switch. Okay, so where we are at the moment, so the previous video we tested the first bank of uh, RAM. I've now fitted the second bank of RAM so we'll quickly test that before we uh, proceed. I mentioned in a previous video there's a fairly easy shortcut uh, to test the uh, two RAM banks. Now if we just power this up, so I power the board and monitor up, uh, if you're interested it's currently drawing one and a half amps so uh, we're getting near now to uh, the peak current draw, it goes slightly higher. So we've now got a, a blank screen, there is a cursor in the top left hand corner but I don't think you can quite see that, but if I put the switch into the fill position and reboot the board you'll see that the display fills with zeros. So in theory at least we're looking at uh, the entire RAM because um, alternate lines are from alternate banks but of course if we're just looking at the same bank all the time we wouldn't know. One way to test that is you can switch it into uh, 12 line mode and of course we turn off every other line. But because the 12 line switch works quite a long way back in the system we can now reboot the board and because we have the board set to 12 line mode um, this bank of RAM has not been initialized so it's just got random values in um, based on whatever was in there when the board booted up. So if we now switch back to 24 line mode we should have uh, a line of garbage followed by a line of zeros followed by a line of garbage etc. And that's exactly what we've got so uh, again apologies on a flicker on here it's uh, just the camera uh, but we've now got garbage and then uh, row zeros garbage uh, and that's just because when we booted up the board we were in 12 line mode and so this uh, bank of RAM uh, was left untouched and it's just got whatever garbage was in there when the power was applied. If we now power the board back up with its switch to 24 line mode we can see that we are once again seeing a full screen of zeros so we can be fairly certain that the um, RAM banks are both working but also that the bank switching and the loading system is working and as I said this data is loaded in a fairly round the houses route it goes through the uh, serial system to a certain extent and that's what I want to look at now if we try to simulate pressing a key, so if I let's see what I'll do, I'll switch it back to uh, standard mode and reboot the board. So the screen's been cleared, 
if I try to simulate pressing a key by shorting one of the key contacts and nothing happens, now we know that the key is being read by the keyboard system. So if I grab the schematic for the keyboard, then what we're looking at here is this is now being scanned, whereas previously we weren't getting in a clock on here, that was because we had a faulty IC. If I go back and look at these pins again, which were inert before, so this is L9 pin 9. You can see we're now getting a clock on there. And if we go to pin 5, and again I simulate pressing a key, you can see that that causes the output of the latch to go low and that's indicating that the key has been detected. Now the way the key data is captured is if we look up here these lines have all been labelled so we've got them labelled as uh, KC1 through to KC7 and these are the keyboard clock lines so as the keyboard is scanned obviously these lines increment and at the instant when the key data line goes low the state that these lines are in is dependent on the key that's pressed. In other words, you'll get a unique code on these lines depending on which key you press when this line drops. And that's the data that's actually used uh, for the key press interpretation. So if we then look at the memory schematic, um, this particular multiplexer here is used to capture that data we've got a couple of multiplexers so you'll see that the inputs go from KC1 up through KC7 and this is where the data is captured from the keyboard system so the um, key data going low causes the system to read these values into the uh, multiplexers and then the data coming out is used for the data to be sent to the UART it's put into the UART and then it's read back into the system if we've got uh, local echo turned on and put into the uh, RAM. The way it's put into the RAM, I'll grab another schematic. So looking at the schematic for the receive part of the serial system, then what we have is this arrangement up here. So this is the receive section of the UART. And when data comes into the UART, it's fed out so it'll get uh, essentially a data ready line and that causes these latches to be updated with whatever data has been captured by the UART and this is the way the data gets into the system if we look at the output of these latches you'll see they're labeled data 1 up through data 7 and then going back to the memory you'll see that the input to the memory is data 1 up through data 7 so it goes through into the uh, RAM chips um, but this is the source of the data, it's out of these latches, which in turn is out of the UART, uh, which means the data has to get in here in the first place. There are various sources of data for the UART. One is the received data line, and that's the data that's coming in through the RS232 port. And there's another one which is uh, called XData, or transmit data, and this is the serial data that is actually coming from the keyboard. So the data is serialized and it comes through here and then depending on the arrangement of this logic or the state of this logic, it makes its way through and into the serial input pin of the UART. It fills up uh, the UART with a full byte of data. That then triggers the data ready. It then reads the byte and puts it through into RAM. Um, so you'll see here this switch, which is full duplex and half duplex. Um, is used to turn off local echo and all it does is it disconnects that incoming serial data from this gate and it stops it getting through to the UART. So in other words it doesn't echo it back into the um, UART. However the incoming data if it's echoed by the remote terminal will still come in through the received data line through into the same port of the UART. So that's the mechanism it uses. There are various uh, logic um, steps in this to prevent mixing of data from the um, remote terminal and the keyboard. So for example, you don't want it to respond if data is coming in from the remote terminal uh, if you're currently pressing a key. That would end up with this garbage coming through uh, into the RAM.
So there are various um, levels of control to make sure that only one of these sources is read at any one time. So in other words, for us to get data from the keyboard into the RAM, this has to be working. So firstly, we need the clock on the, or the receive clock on this uh, device to be working. So that's pin 40, so we need to check to see if we're getting um, the receive clock. So we'll look at pin 40 on the UART and notice there's nothing there at all. Uh, and also if we then look at uh, pin 20, which is the incoming data, uh, we should see a serial data on here whenever we simulate pressing a key. And again, there's nothing there at all. Uh, it's not surprising. So if we grab the schematic for part of the serial system, this is the transmit part of the serial system. So what happens is when you hit a key, um, the data is fed out into the UART and that comes out through these X data lines and these are the lines that we saw on the uh, latches that were on the uh, uh, memory card or memory schematic. And the data is then fed out of the serial out pin of the UART and it makes its way out through the RS232 port. In other words, when you hit a key, the data is put into the UART and then it makes its way out in a serial form through the RS232 port. But it also comes through to here, and this is the not x data line that we just saw on the other schematic. And this is how it gets back into the receive section of the UART. So in other words, the transmit out pin loops back to the receive in pin. It just loops the data back around and echoes it locally if this switch is closed. So looking back here, we'll notice that this um, gate here that controls the X data out is controlled in turn by this device, which is A6. And of course, we don't have A6 fitted. So because we don't have A6 fitted, this will be inactive. And the same is true of several of these lines. We don't have the um, logic enabled to allow this loop back. So I'll just fit the two devices that are required to get that up and running and we'll give it another test. Okay, I fitted the two devices that control those gates. Uh, I haven't fitted the other two yet. I don't want to test the outgoing serial and incoming serial just yet. I'm just looking here at the loopback testing so we can test the local system. I'll power it back up. And we'll look back now and see if we're getting the clock on the UART. So now you see that we are getting a clock on the UART that wasn't there before. Uh, the reason incidentally the clock is controllable, not as permanently connected, is uh, if you're familiar with RS-232 and serial protocols, you'll know that um, you need to be able to uh, control or handshake the exchange of data. So in other words, the remote terminal needs the ability to stop the terminal sending uh, while it's processing data. And so the way it does that is there are various incoming control lines. One of those is used to uh, gate off the clock going to the UART and that will basically halt it until such time as the remote terminal decides it can accept more data. It will gate the clock back on and then the UART will send the next data and then the remote terminal can turn it off again. So it's a way for the uh, remote system to be able to control the uh, rate at which bytes are sent. Now, of course, the bit rate is set by the board rate, so that's not changed remotely, but the rate at which the bytes are sent can be changed. Okay, so we now have that clock present, and if we look at pin 20, again, I'll simulate pressing a key, and there was nothing here before, but now, let's slow the scope down a bit. But now you can see that we are getting what looks like serial data. So the data is now making its way into the UART and if you look at the uh, screen you'll actually see that we're now reading characters. So all I'm doing here is simulating keys by shorting 
and I can move the cursor around. I'll turn the brightness up. Okay, hopefully you can see that's a bit better. Uh, it's flickering, uh, but again, that's just the camera. So if I try hitting the one key, we should get ones appearing. Should we do the two key, three, four, Now, as you can see, we're getting to the point where data is now making its way from the keyboard through the outgoing uh, RS-232 into the incoming RS-232 and forward into the RAM. And that's all working successfully. We're correctly displaying the characters. So that's looking uh, very promising. It's uh, a big step forward. And where we are now is we can start looking at the actual serial data going out of the system and serial data coming in. That's mostly working already because um, this has to work for what we're seeing on the screen to work. Doesn't mean it's working 100% and there is still a lot of testing to do on this board yet. So for example, we have interpretation of incoming data. I'll just grab the schematic that relates to that. Okay, so this is the receive section of the schematic again. Uh, we have these two latches that receive the incoming data and they feed the data through to the RAM. Uh, but some values are not fed through as uh, characters. They're actually interpreted as commands and that's what uh, this is doing down here. So this arrangement is used to detect when we've got a command coming in and it stops the value being put into the RAM. So it blocks it from being put into the display RAM so certain values don't get displayed. They cause certain actions, control actions within the system. And um, they're interpreted here and come through onto these lines as a command. So each one of these is one of the commands that the system can respond to. So the next step really is to start looking to see if these particular commands are working. And these all trigger a sequence of events. So for example, clearing the screen, holding the cursor, this sort of thing. And um, it should in theory start getting easier now because these are looking at specific uh, functions within the overall system. And then we can start looking to see if there's any particular faults or errors or if certain things aren't working the way that they should. So for example, if we use the control characters, they're handled in a different way to the displayed characters. So if, for example, I simulate holding the control key down by shorting out the key contacts, I should now be able to move the cursor around the screen, which I can. So that's the up arrow, that's control up, control right, control down, and control left. So you can see that's all working fine. Whether or not all the functions work, I don't know. I haven't tried them yet. You've seen as much as I've seen. Um, but the next step is to go through, check every single key is working the way it should. Bear in mind that this is a new layout. I'm not just testing the board. I'm testing the board layout. I need to make sure I've got all the keys uh, wired in the way they should be. Make sure the correct key creates the correct code on the uh, screen. Uh, and then I can start looking to see if the serial in and serial out is working. We know it's working up to a certain point because that's the data that we're reading in here. But I need to make sure that it's working and all the interlocks and various control features work. Um, we're getting fairly close now to a, uh, a fully working system, but as I said, there is still a lot of testing because of the number of internal functions. Some we've just seen we know work already. Uh, others um, may not work. It's really a case of going through them all one by one and dealing with any issues that um, I come across. Um, before I finish this video, I'll just move the camera so you can get a closer look at the screen and get some idea as to how it actually looks. It's much better quality display than is coming across on the camera. Um, all traces of noise, retrace, all that is uh, gone. That's been dealt with with the blanking. Still badly distorted because this monitor doesn't like the uh, refresh rates that we're using. But the actual display of the characters is very nice and crisp and clear. So I'll move the camera so you can get a closer look at that.
Okay, hopefully you can see that a bit more clearly. I'll just simulate pressing a few more keys. And if I go to the end, it should give us a new line, which it does. Different character. Try space. So, in other words, it's looking like we're getting fairly close now to the system actually being um, usable. So, what I'll do in the next video is start looking at testing the individual command functions. We'll look at the uh, RS232 out and uh, the video after that we'll actually try hooking it up to a PC and see if we can get it to communicate with a terminal program. So comments welcome uh, and again if you're interested in one of these then let me know. I do have limited numbers but I can order more if uh, there is any interest in them. Uh, what I'll be providing is the bare board a bill of materials and you can then uh, use a copy of the original service manual that covers this particular version to uh, figure out exactly how all the circuits work and um, you won't need to go to anything like this amount of testing I'm just doing this to make sure that I've got uh, all the track layout correct and I haven't made any errors I uh, haven't found any so far so it's looking good that's not to say I won't find some in the upcoming testing but I will of course also provide an errata sheet that details any errors so if I find there are errors on the board uh, then I will of course document those and um, any modifications will need to be made by the builder to deal with those. Um, but it will be a very nice project, a very nice addition to anyone that's interested in this sort of thing but it is in itself a very interesting project. It's uh, one of these things that's uh, a lot of fun to work on. Um, so as I said, any comments let me know and in the next video we'll start looking at the uh, commands. Before I finish this video, I just thought it worth mentioning that um, you may have noticed I only have the single supply hooked up to the board, so I've only got the 5 volt rails working, even though I'm using this UART, which requires, um, as far as the spec sheet for the device that's specified for the board, which is a 1602, needed a minus 12 volt supply to work. And the minus 12 volt supply is indeed fed through to the correct pin on the IC socket. However, this is a D version of the chip and it's a single 5 volt supply version of the device. It does not need the minus 12 volt. Uh, so, although it's got minus 12 volts going to the socket, on this particular variant that pin's not connected internally on the device and so the board will work fine at least up to this point without the minus 12 volt rail connected. So if you were wondering about that, that's why this is still working. It's just the D version and it doesn't need the minus 12 volts.